We're going to switch gears a bit. We're going to look at our four-legged friends that ribbit in the water. So here we go with some frog talks. And we're going to introduce Danny, and he's talking about frog ID. Yep. OK. Hey, everyone. Um, I made some hasty last-minute changes to my presentation because some of the slides and stuff I was going to talk about you would have already heard in the plenary session. So. <laughs> If the structure is a bit um, uh, uh, random, it, <laughs> apologies for that. Um, so the Frog ID project, for those that, uh, if you should already have heard a little bit about it, uh, we're recording using um, frog calls recorded um, through the app and submitted with geotagging to identify species presence across Australia. And um, we've partnered with uh, the other state and territory museums. It's an Australian museum project and we've partnered with them to roll it out. And um, in terms of our data, uh, what we're trying, I will talk about a little bit today is how we're trying to make that accessible to our users and use the data that we're collecting to keep them engaged as well. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, how to, so how, do you, how you can do what we're doing and some tips of um, the way um, you can create and keep people engaged using the data. Um, so for, on our website, we have um, a leaderboard and up-to-date stats so that the users can go straight there. So this is publicly available on our website under the results and map section. Um, people can see how many species have been found at any one time. And that is live, like connected to the validation process. So as people are listening to and identifying calls, those species numbers are updating. Um, below that, uh, there is a map which we are also building an, um, functionality into so that there will have more availability of data based on species and times of identification. At the moment, um, it just shows uh, locations of species across the map. Um, so how the app works is we've got uh, 241 species of frogs um, listed which have profiles and recordings. And people can use the explore feature to look at all the species, or you can use the filter on the top left to limit them to species that are found uh, in the local area. Uh, the record feature is um, the main feature in the middle of the app. Um, you hit the record button, and you get 20 seconds. We need minimum 20 seconds of recording, where the spikes will show you how loud the frog calls are. And then the user gets a chance to try and identify themselves what species they think it is before they submit it through. Um, that's an optional feature, so they don't, some, many users don't try and select which species it is before they send it through. Um, on the website, an important uh, function of, our, of the website is having people join and form local groups. So what we're planning on doing over the next uh, 12 months is we really want to establish a lot of local groups and have um, communications going to those groups saying what events are on or what time of year frogs are calling and if we are able to get on top of it like when there's rainfall or it's a great time to go frogging we can ask people in certain areas to go out so if you um, are interested in getting or know anyone that might want to start a local group um, we encourage you to do that uh, Jody's been travelling around. Um, doc Dr. Jody Rowley is a uh, leading biologist and she's been doing a lot of work um, talking to media and, and visiting local museums and doing talks. And she's trying to really establish those um, groups at the moment. And what we really want to do is see, in terms of our um, supporter database, we want to see that reflected in the, the groups and the locations that she's visiting. Um, on that leaderboard that I mentioned on the website, we've got the top groups. So um, at the moment, it's listed by um, the captures count. And we want to be able to um, create kind of more of a gamification of that so that the, um, the, the groups that are doing the most calls or the most events get rewarded for that. Um, within the website, users are able to log in and see their own captures. So in this example here, you can see that there's um, calls pending, validated, and published, so people can see. It's a great tool for people to be able to go back and have access to all their own recordings at any one time, anywhere they like, want to have access, they can go and get that off the website. 
Um, and if people are attaching photos to those calls and things, they can access those as well. Um, so with the local groups that we're looking at establishing, we really want to have events listed on our website and create, um, so at the moment, like under the events tab, when we have events located, there's little drop-ins shown so people can see what's happening near them and what local groups are setting up. So we really want to know if there's, um, I know that there's um, established Frogger groups already, so what we want to do is get to know when those Frogger groups are running things that we list them on our website and we can help create a central point for people nationally to see what frogging events are coming up. Um, the, one of the tools we're using for our CRM allows us to um, run filters. So um, using logic where you can exclude um, certain things. So you, you can do searches for frog ID users who have attended certain events. And um, in terms of data, I think that's really important to highlight people who you can also do run that the other way around where people, you can find people who have attended events but aren't actually signed up to use the app yet. So that way you can get in contact with people who have registered for events and send, send some follow up messages saying thanks for coming. Would you really like, we'd love it if you signed up and used Frog ID. So um, of course that's always a limit to capacity on how much comms you can personalise and send out. Um, so bringing us to comms. Um, in, with Frog ID, we've been sending, tried to send out regular emails and updates um, to people, and I was going to just include a, little, a few tips with emailing. Um, when you're sending out emails to people, um, it's great to put in um, visual images and links to media and, and news and things. So if there's photo contents that you're sharing online or videos or results that you'd like people to know, putting in graphical content is really good. Um, you, this isn't actually an embedded video, um, but you can put in a play button kind of thing that when people click on it, it will link back to either your YouTube content or your Facebook content as well. Um, oh, <laughs> this is, I was going to put in some tips on emailing. So if you're going to send out emails and ask people to do something, um, a really simple structure, and this is something that I, um, I've learnt from um, social media training sessions that I thought I'd quickly share with people because it might help people is you really want to have in your email the problem and the solution, especially if you're asking people to take action on something. You want to make it really clear how what you're asking them to do is going to have an, a result or an impact. Because a lot of people won't want to take an action if they don't think there's any point to it. Um, or also, if you just ask someone to do something and there doesn't seem to be a correlation between what they're doing and the problem or the solution, people are less likely to respond to a call to action. So an um, example that I was using was our planet is warming at an alarming rate due to cars. If you take photos of cars, you can help stop climate change. Take photos of cars now. Now I'm not really sure if that would actually work, but what, the shorter you can make your, like your explanation, you might want to support all the supporting evidence below that, but if you can get that into the size of like a tweet or the top of your message, then people have the chance to find, really quickly read, what is this person asking me to do? Do I have time to do it? and do I really care about it before they might want to go through the rest of the body of the email and find all the evidence that you've put in there to support why you want to do it. You want to make sure that they know straight away what it is you're asking them to do. Um, so in terms of the data that we've collected so far, we've only been running for a couple of months, but it's been really um, amazing that we've gotten data from areas that are quite difficult to uh, access sometimes. So like there's frogs in arid areas that only call during certain rainy periods and often when it rains and it floods and scientists aren't even able to get there. So having citizen scientists on the ground sending us information has been, sending us content has been amazing. Um, this is one of the calls that we received from the other room. From um, some pretty rare folks that only surface up the rain. Sorry, I'll cut that off. Um, but if you're interested, you can always go to our Facebook and check that out. Um, so the, um, my timer has disappeared on my phone. Um, the, we've also had calls that are pretty interesting from our urban populations as well. So um, this one is one that was recorded in inner Sydney um, and by a frog that's um, pretty threatened by housing development. Thank 
So with the content that we're putting out there, um, we're very reliant on our port frog validators, who, um, like Dr. Jody Rowley, who will identify what species and what calls we're getting that is really um, exciting. And she will send through content and recommend that we put things up. And then we will try and keep like a, a feedback loop to the people who are sending things through um, so that they get updates of what's going on. And, um, and I'll try to plan that content and schedule it out in advance. Um, some of the other content and things that we're putting up is we're using like um, memes and things to keep people engaged. So we're sending through, oh, sorry, not a meme, because meme usually is like ironic and funny. So this is more of a, just a Facebook square. There's no joke in, in these graphics. <laughs> but um, the, the content and tips are often included in our app and the sign up process as well. But we want to keep reminding people and keeping people engaged. So, and also giving them content that they can share with people. So we're trying to sign up school groups and things. So the more resources and, um, that are available for people to share and inform people on what they need to do is the better. Um, you don't need to be amazing at Photoshop or using stuff. One of the tips I was going to suggest is um, Canva, for those that don't know or use it. Um, Canva is a free online um, software. And it has a lot of templates like this. So you just can upload your own graphics, type in your own text, and then save um, these kind of squares straight to your desktop. Um, it's really easy and fast to use, and you don't need to buy anything. So you don't need to have Photoshop to use Canva. Um, I recommend you can also save templates. So if you're using it a lot, um, to you want to send create graphics for social media, um, you can save things that you've done before and just update the text and the images for them. Um, we've put out a lot of like uh, videos. This is some of the, the videos that we've put out in the last couple of weeks. Um, frog or not, um, can you guess? Um, one, of the, one of the videos that we've used is quite as in, like, to inform people is can you tell the difference between the sound of a cricket and a frog? Um, because we, get, we do get quite a few people who record crickets. So having that video a link to send through to people to say, um, have you, this is what the difference is. So. <laughs> Um, again, you, if you don't know how to edit video and you're thinking that's outside, I can't do that, um, I really recommend Splice um, for your mobile device. Um, it's also free. Um, and you, the only hard thing is if you haven't shot the video on your own phone, someone else has it, getting all those videos on your phone can be a bit tricky. But if you're just shooting stuff on your own phone um, with Splice, you can edit. Um, you just press like these little blue plus buttons to insert new clips together, and you can decide whether you can trim and edit the clips, and you can add effects like text over the top. Um, you can even use Splice if you don't have any video, like if all you have is photos from your project, but you want to maybe create a slideshow and add music over the top, and then add text and headings and statistics. You can do that as well with Splice. So all you need to do is save all the images that you want to turn into a video onto your phone. Um, and then use Splice, Splice to create a download. Um, I, when I forget what it's called, I just think of the ice cream, the nice with the green. Um, here's one of the, the video that we use for can you tell the difference between a frog and a cricket? Um, and a lot of people found this one useful. I think we've had a lot of people share it and said, oh, thank you. Now I know. I'll start recording those crickets outside. Um, oh, this one. This one did quite well. It's a frog or not one. So this did work well over our Christmas tree. That's not a frog. That's a porcupine. That is a frog. <laughs> I won't go through all of that. And also, you're know, keeping people informed when today we've had to um, acknowledge a little bit of a, um, some lost calls that we've had. So keeping people informed and getting feedback is also super important. Um, that is the end of my talk. Um, if anyone, I really like talking about data, keeping users engaged, social media. If anyone wants to talk, discuss that with me um, at any point, um, please, I'd love to have a chat. So. Thanks.